Hello and welcome. It's a brand new semester and we're entering into our very first chapter of the SEM. Chapter 1, Biodiversity. I'm Miss Delia and if you're ready, let's get started. Chapter 1, Biodiversity is one of the longest chapters in this semester. And as you can see here, it consists of seven subtopics. But before you get too scared, I just want to let you know that 1.3, Diversity of Bacteria, this subtopic is actually an experiment module. So the ones that you actually need to read the lecture notes and do the tutorial questions is 1.1, 1.2, and then 1.4 until 1.7. With that being said, I'm going to go on into 1.1, which is biodiversity and classification. And of course, as usual, before we get into the content itself, I'll first have a look at the learning objectives. I hope that by the end of this video, you would be able to state the types of biodiversity, state what is hierarchical classification, and also explain briefly the classification systems that we're going to learn about in this chapter, which is the five kingdom system and the three domain system. Now, um, before we go into the whole system system stuff, let's first talk. What's biodiversity? We'll start with the word diversity, okay? So diversity could also mean variety. Berapa pelbagai jenis sesuatu. Okay, how many types of things, how many varieties of things. And BM, we can say diversity is also kepelbagaian. So a lot of the stuff in this chapter is actually talking about the variety of living things, okay? Kepelbagaian benda hidup yang kita boleh tengok, yang kita boleh kaji. And then that brings us into the types of biodiversity. So there's more than one way to look at the biodiversity in our world. We can look, is it genetic diversity? Is it species diversity? Or is it ecosystem diversity? So sini ada dia punya uh, explanation pendek, tapi kita akan tengok satu per satu. Okay, so we'll talk about what is genetic diversity. So this is the combination of different genes found within a population of a single species or within different populations of the same species. Dalam erti kata lain, bila kita tengok satu species organisme, contohnya kita tengok dalam species anjing, apakah kepelbagaian dari segi dia punya genetik, dari segi DNA dalam species tersebut? How different is one individual dog's DNA from the other individual dogs in that species? This can also be applied to plants and other organisms. For example, within corn, okay, in the species of corn, jagung pun dikira sebagai satu species, di kalangan jagung tu berapa banyak kepelbagaian dari segi genetik yang kita boleh jumpa dalam jagung. So as you can see here, in this corn, there's already diversity in terms of the seed color and the seed shape, etc., etc. Another type of diversity that we talk about is species diversity. So, ini adalah genus diversity yang kedua. And this is usually what people think of when we talk about biodiversity, which is the variety of species in an ecosystem or throughout the entire biosphere. Pendek kata, dalam sesuatu kawasan, Atau dalam sesuatu ekosistem, dalam sesuatu biosphere, ada berapa spesies haiwan, berapa spesies tumbuhan, berapa spesies fungus, dan berapa spesies kuman kita boleh jumpa. Okay, so this is the variety or the numbers of species in an ecosystem. And last but not least, we also have ecosystem diversity. Ecosystem diversity is the variety of ecosystems and ecological processes in the biosphere as well as the diversity within ecosystems. So, ini kita bukan sahaja bayangkan haiwan ataupun tumbuhan ataupun kuman itu sahaja, tapi kita tengok keseluruhan kawasan itu, keseluruhan ekosistem itu. Bukan sahaja benda hidup, tetapi juga benda bukan hidup dan interaksi di antara mereka. Okay, so if the whole world has no ecosystem diversity, that means the whole world looks the exact same everywhere. But our earth is not like that. Our earth has 
very high ecosystem diversity. Dunia kita ini, bumi kita ini ada banyak ecosystem diversity. Which is why in one area you can have natural ecosystem and another area has artificial ecosystems. Your natural area can be terrestrial, dia boleh daratan, it can be aquatic, okay, iaitu ada air. Even aquatic environments, they can be fresh water, they can be marine water. Fresh water also has different types of ecosystems. Marine what, uh, marine ecosystems also have different types. So it can be in an ocean, it can be in a sea. Okay, so if you can imagine all these different places, that means you are imagining a variety of ecosystems. Okay, so those are the three types of biodiversity that you learn about in your syllabus, which is genetic diversity, species diversity, and ecosystem diversity. We can also say that when we learn this, we're looking at the smallest scale and the largest scale. Pada skala yang paling kecil, kita adalah tengok genetic diversity. It is the smallest scale that we can use to look at the biodiversity of living things. The largest scale that we can use to look at biodiversity is ecosystem diversity. Okay, so kalau kita cakap pasal ecosystem diversity, kita sedang tengok biodiversity pada skala yang paling besar. Alright, so let us continue with talking about classification. We are going to move on into hierarchical classification and taxonomy. A hierarchical classification or hierarchical system is used for classifying organisms to the species level. This system is called taxonomic classification. Okay, apa kaitan ini dengan apa yang kita baru belajar tadi pasal biodiversity? We'll first try to understand what is hierarchical classification and also the word hierarchy. Hierarchy means a system or organization with ranking. Kita sedang mengatur sesuatu mengikut dia punya pangkat atau mengikut peringkat. Hierarchical system is used to classify organisms to the species level. Means, kita menggunakan sistem hierarchy, sistem yang berperingkat, untuk menyusun organism kepada spesies-spesies yang berbeza. Sistem yang kita gunakan ini digelar sebagai taxonomic classification. Ini adalah nama dia. Now that brings us to the word taxonomy. The definition of taxonomy is the science of naming, describing, and classifying organisms. Ini adalah definisi untuk perkataan taxonomy. That means when we are doing anything relating to taxonomy, we are actually including these three things. We are looking at identification of something. Kita sedang mengenal pasti sesuatu. We're looking at the classification of some things. Kita mengelaskan ataupun kita bahagikan sesuatu kepada kelas-kelas yang berbeza. And nomenclature or naming. Okay? Lepas kita kasih pis, kenal pasti apa itu, kita kasih pisah dia kepada kumpulan dan kemudian kita bagi dia nama yang khas penamaan. Okay, so this is the taxonomy that we use in biology. Over here on the left side, I show you the taxonomic group that we use in biology. Biological classification is based on taxon. What is taxon? Taxon is a group of organisms at a particular level in a classification system. In taxonomy hierarchy, there are eight taxons. Paling ringkas cakap, satu taxon adalah satu peringkat ataupun satu level untuk mengklasifikasikan organisma. The broadest classifications are by domain. So, yang paling general, yang paling umum adalah domain. While the most specific classification is by species. Okay, yang paling spesifik, yang paling terperinci adalah species. So, the taxonomic groups that we use are domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. And this is an acronym that you can use to memorize or to remember the order of the taxons. You can also create your own acronym. 
use whatever works for you to help you remember the order of the taxons. So I like to use Dear King Philip came over from Great Spain. So D, dear, corresponds to domain. King, K, is kingdom. Philip, starts with P, is phylum. Came, starts with C, class. O, over, starts with O, order. From, family. Great, genus. S, species. So this is how I remember domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and then species. Now that you remember the order of the taxons, let's try to look at two organisms and classify them according to the taxonomy. So here we have a picture of a human and a picture of an orangutan. So I'm going to start with the human one and I am going to classify as humans based on the taxonomy. We're going to start with the domain. So humans are eukaryotics. So we are in domain eukarya. We are under kingdom animalia. Our phylum is chordata. Our class is mammalia. Our order is primates. Our family is hominidae. Our genus is homo. Our species is homo sapiens. Our scientific name is homo sapiens. And our common name is human. Now let's have a try at giving the taxonomy for the orangutan. So the orangutan is also in domain eukarya, kingdom animalia, phylum chordata, class mammalia, order primates, family hominidae, genus pongo, species pongo pygmaeus, and therefore its scientific name will also be pongo pygmaeus. And its common name is Borneoan orangutan. As you can see here, there's some similarities and also some differences. So you already know that humans, us, people, have a lot of similarities with orangutans. And also that is reflected in our organization in the taxonomic system. Kita, sebab kita ada banyak persama, persamaan. Dan mungkin juga uh, dari segi evolusi ada keturunan yang hampir sama. So itulah kita diletakkan dalam domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family yang sama. Tetapi genus dengan spesies kita berbeza. So you can see this trend in a lot of other organisms in nature as well. So when we are looking at taxonomy and we want to compare between the coyote and the grey wolf, you will see that they are both classified under the same domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, and genus, but they are different species. So ini lagi dekat and lagi hampir berbanding manusia dengan orangutan. Okay, so everything is the same here. It's eukarya, animalia, cordata, mammalia, carnivora, canidae, canis. But the species for coyote is Canis latrans, and the species for the grey wolf is Canis lupus. Now, you may notice something. When I'm giving the scientific name of these organisms, I always use two words. And that is because of this thing called binomial nomenclature. What's binomial nomenclature? Binomial nomenclature, also called Two name naming system, system penamaan yang menggunakan dua nama, is the naming system of organisms. Based on this system, species is given a scientific name composed of two parts, which is the genus and the species. Bila kita menamakan sesuatu menggunakan kaedah scientific, kita bagi nama berdasarkan dia punya genus dan dia punya species. And both of these will usually use the latin language okay kedua-duanya akan mengguna biasanya menggunakan bahasa latin so the first part is genus or generic name second part is species or species name this is a system that is introduced by swedish naturalist carl linnaeus so scientist ini carl linnaeus yang uh, mengajukan atau mencadangkan sistem penamaan seperti ini 
sebelum Carl Linnaeus bagi cadangan ini, kadang-kadang orang bagi nama yang panjang-panjang untuk organism yang simple saja sampai ada tujuh nama. So the two naming system is actually quite efficient and very it works very well for biologists so far. Okay, so down here we have an example with the common, uh, not really common, this is called a pebble crab. So, satu jenis ketam yang dipanggil sebagai pebble crab. Nama scientific dia adalah Xanthias lamarckii. Okay, so sometimes these Latin naming, um, Latin names will have slightly different pronunciations and you can always Google to know how is the proper pronunciation for a certain word. Okay, so uh, when you're writing the binomial nomenclature, please try to remember these. The first alphabet of the genus is written in capital letter. All letters in the species are in lowercase. And both parts are italicized, yaitu kita singet kan, if it is typed or underlined, kita garis kalau ditulis sebagai tangan, okay, if that is handwritten. So we have an example here. Another example is if you take the common name frog, okay? Organism is frog. To give the scientific name of frog, it is rana temporaria. And as you can see here, rana temporaria, when I type, the R in rana is capital letter. Dia mesti huruf besar. Disengetkan, italicized. Ada space. Kemudian nama spesies dia disengetkan juga. If I want to write by hand, if it is handwritten, it will look like this. Rana temporaria, and then I underline. Tengok di sini, R masih huruf besar. Dan di bawah setiap perkataan, saya garis. Dan garis dia tidak berterusannya. So, rana satu garis, temporaria satu garis. Tidak payah kasih senget tulisan kamu. So that is how you write based on binomial nomenclature. There is also another format to write scientific names. Say for example, if the genus of an organism is known but its species is unknown, its scientific name can be written as such. For example, I am looking at this organism. It is called Sulfolobus species. Saya tahu dia punya genus, tapi saya tidak tahu dia punya spesies. Then saya boleh tulis seperti ini. Saya tulis saja sulfolobus, sp dot. If I type, it will look like this. If I write by hand, it will look like this. The genus is sulfolobus. If I'm typing, macam biasa lah. If I'm writing by hand, I underline. First letter capitalized, italicized if it is typed or underlined if it is handwritten. And the species, since I don't know, I'm just going to write sp dot. The sp dot is all lowercase. It ends with the dot, mesti ada titik di hujung. And it is not italicized or underlined. Tidak payah kasih senget, tidak payah underline. So this is how you would write if you don't know the species but you know the genus. Okay, so that's it for the binomial nomenclature system. And we'll have a very short summary of what we've learned so far. Try to answer these questions on your own. Cuba jawab soalan soalan ni sendiri. Try to state what are the types of biodiversity that we learned about. What is hierarchical classification? What is taxonomy? How many taxon is in a taxonomy system? Try to state each taxon. Who proposed the taxonomy system? If you can't answer any of these questions, try to go back to the notes or to this video once again. If you're good, let's proceed with the next part of the lesson. In this next part of the lesson, we're going to explore the two classification systems that is in your syllabus. The first system is the five kingdom system and the second system is the three domain system. So we're having a look at the five kingdom system first. 
The Five Kingdom system is a classification system that is suggested by Robert Harding Whittaker and it is published in 1969. So Robert Harding Whittaker classified living organisms based on the three following criteria. The first criteria is the level of cell organization. The second is the type of organism. The third is modes of nutrition. So cara Whittaker mengklasifikasikan organism adalah dia tiga dia tengok kepada tiga kriteria. Tiga kriteria ini adalah level of cell organization, types of organism dan modes of nutrition. Selalu saya rasa saya terkeliru di antara yang pertama dengan yang kedua. So please pay attention to what it means by level of cell organization and types of organism. Tengok betul-betul ya. Bila kita cakap level of cell organization, itu bermaksud kita tengok sama ada organism itu adalah prokaryotik ataupun eukaryotik. Yaitu dia ada nukleus benar ataupun tiada nukleus benar. When we talk about types of organism, we're actually talking about whether it is unicellular organism or multicellular organism. Okay, so try not to get these two things confused. And lastly, the third criteria is modes of nutrition. Uh, first things first is we look at it whether or not it is autotrophic and photosynthetic. Kalau dia boleh hasilkan uh, makanan melalui fotosintesis, then dia automatic adalah autotrophic mengikut Whittaker punya sistem. Kalau dia bukan autotrophic, dia adalah heterotrophic. Means it needs to get its nutrients from outside its body. So it can be saprophytic or holozoic. Saprophytic means dia menyerap zat daripada luar badan dia ke dalam badan dia. Holozoic means dia perlu makan. It has to ingest something to acquire the nutrients. So let's try to apply Robert Whittaker's three criteria to organize organisms into the five kingdoms. So you get a living organism, whether this living organism is a microorganism, a fungus, a plant, or a fish. Okay, first things first, you look at your organism and see what is its level of cell organization. Is it a prokaryote or is it a eukaryote? If it is a prokaryote, then it is automatically in kingdom Monera. If it is a eukaryote, then we will move on to the second criteria based on we take a system. We look at the types of organism. Types of organism is talking about whether that organism is unicellular or multicellular. If your organism is eukaryotic and unicellular, it automatically goes under kingdom protista. If it is eukaryotic and multicellular, then we need to go into the third criteria, which is the modes of nutrition. Can your organism produce its own nutrients by photosynthesis or not? If it can, produced by photosynthesis, that means your organism is photosynthetic and also autotrophic. If not, then it will be considered heterotrophic. If it is photosynthetic autotrophic, then it goes into kingdom plantae. If it is heterotrophic, then we will look at its mode of nutrition once again. Is it heterotrophic and saprophytic or is it heterotrophic and holozoic? Adakah dia serap dia punya zat ataupun adalah adakah dia perlu makan benda untuk mendapatkan zat? If it is saprophytic, then it goes under kingdom fungi and if it is holozoic, then it goes into kingdom animalia. And th there you go. That is how you use the three criteria based on our hedge we take a system to put things into five different kingdoms based on this diagram you should have a good idea of how to classify organisms into the five kingdoms
Tapi kalau orang minta kamu untuk explain secara ringkas ataupun tulis essay pasal Whitaker punya Five Kingdom System, macam mana kamu mau jawab? Ini adalah cadangan kami untuk macam mana kamu jawab atau kalau sama dalam essay ataupun kamu mau jelaskan kepada seseorang. So, first things first, kamu nyatakan tiga kriteria itu. Okay, when you want to explain about the five kingdom system, you first state the three criteria that Robert Whittaker uses. And then you explain each of the criteria. So, let's look at the explanation for the first criteria, which is levels of cell organization. When we talk about levels of cell organization, we are talking about whether the organism is a prokaryote or eukaryote. All prokaryotes will belong to Kingdom Monera, and Kingdom Monera comprises of cells without true nucleus, such as bacteria and cyanobacteria. All the eukaryotes belong to Kingdom Protista, Fungi, Plantae, and Animalia. These four kingdoms comprise of cells with true nucleus. And that's how you explain the first criteria. Moving on to the second criteria is the types of organisms. Types of organisms refer to if the organism is unicellular or is it multicellular. All eukaryotic unicellular organisms belong to Kingdom Protista. Kingdom Protista is comprising of all eukaryotic unicellular organisms such as protozoa and also some eukaryotic multicellular organisms such as algae. Most eukaryotic multicellular organisms will belong to Kingdom Fungi, Plantae, and Animalia. And that brings us to the third criteria used by Whittaker, which is modes of nutrition of multicellular eukaryotes. When we talk about the modes of nutrition, we're talking about autotrophics, which is photosynthetic, and heterotrophics. Autotrophic organism manufactures its own food from inorganic substances. Autotrophic or photosynthetic nutritional mode belongs to kingdom plantae. Heterotrophic organisms cannot manufacture its own food and instead obtains its food and energy by taking in organic substances, usually plant or animal matter. Heterotrophic organism is either saprophytic, which is absorptive, or holozoic, which is ingestive. Continuing with that, multicellular eukaryotes that has saprophytic, which is heterotrophic absorptive, nutritional mode belongs to kingdom fungi. Saprophytic organisms get energy from dead and decaying organic matter by external digestion followed by absorption. Multicellular eukaryote that has holozoic, which is heterotrophic ingestive, nutritional mode, belongs to kingdom animalia. Holozoic organisms obtain nourishment by feeding or ingesting on plants or other animals. And that is very briefly how you explain the five kingdom system. And it is also illustrated beautifully here in this summary diagram. So that is it for Whittaker's five kingdom system. We're now going to move on to another system which is called the three domain system. This system is coined by Carl Richard Woese and his research was published in 1977. Based on the three domain system, it is actually based on the differences in the ribosomal RNA or rRNA base sequence between microorganisms. In case you forget, the rRNA is the molecular building block for ribosomes. Okay, so this is Carl Richard Woese himself. That's a picture of him. And what his research actually was, in a nutshell, he took lots of different microorganisms took out the rRNA from each of those microorganisms, look at their base sequences, so the U, the A, the C, the G, and basically compare 
microorganism number one to number two, number two to number three, number three to number four, and so on and so on and so on. And then, when he looks at the rRNA that are kind of similar, okay, tidak banyak beza rRNA bacteria pertama dengan yang kedua, dia longgokkan dalam satu kumpulan. Kalau jauh beza, dia punya sequence rRNA dan dia akan pisahkan untuk kumpulan yang berbeza dan jauh sikit. Daripada research dia yang panjang, lama dia buat di lab, akhirnya dia dapat conclusion bahawa benda-benda hidup di dunia ini boleh dibagikan kepada tiga domain, iaitu domain bacteria, domain archaea dan domain eukarya. So based on his research and comparing the base sequences between microorganisms, he managed to come up with three domains that he thinks all living things on earth is classified under. These three domains are domain bacteria, domain archaea, and domain eukarya. We'll look at domain bacteria and archaea together. Domain bacteria and archaea are prokaryotes. They are mostly single cell and microscopic, whereas the this other domain, domain eukarya, are all eukaryotes. They include both unicellular and multicellular organisms. And the unicellular organisms is usually what we put into kingdom protista. The multicellular eukaryotes are what we put into kingdom fungi, plantae, and kingdom animalia. So these are the three domains of life according to Carl Woe's research so you have the domain bacteria domain archaea and domain eukarya so you can read the explanations for each of them right here and you can also best understand carl Woe's research through phylogenetic trees okay kita boleh gunakan phylogenetic tree untuk tengok mana satu group yang lebih milip kepada group yang lain dan mana satu group yang lebih jauh beza banding dengan group yang lain. So this is an example of a phylogenetic tree and this is how he came up with the three domains which is bacteria over here in purple, archaea over here in blue green and eukarya over here in orange. Remember this research was done based on the rRNA sequences of each of these organisms. Okay, so that is it for the three domain system and that is it for 1.1. I know I said it was a short subtopic, but it actually went on for a bit long. So very quick lesson summary. These are the eight taxons. This is how you write scientific names according to binomial nomenclature. You learn about the five kingdom system and also the three domain system. And a very quick lesson summary by using questions. Try to answer each of these questions on your own. You can pause the video if you want to. State the two classification systems. Who proposed the five kingdom system classification? Name the kingdoms. Who proposed the three domain system? Name the domains. How are the organisms in the five kingdoms classified? And how are the organisms in the three domains classified? Are you able to answer all of these questions? If yes, good job. If not, it's time to have a look at the notes once again. So we're done with 1.1. What should you do now? Now you should practice writing the scientific names of some organisms you know. Maybe you can start with your favorite animal or plant. Try to Google the scientific name for it. After that, Please come up with your own short notes for this subtopic and move on to the next one. So that's it for 1.1. I hope to see you again in 1.2. Bye!